church. So I asked Brother Louis if he would pick a couple of things where he sees that false teaching has infiltrated the church and give us a word this morning. So Brother Louis, would you come? Good morning, everyone. So as Pastor was saying, we discussed apostasy last week. And apostasy is when you have somebody who was raised as a Christian, went through the whole nine yards, baptized, and then at some point decided, nah, I don't believe that, and just totally turns away from the church. Um, without actually redoing his sermon, it was kind of hard to think of different uh, examples of that. So I decided to do it on the heresies of the church. Now, um, a heresy is a belief or action which seriously disagrees with the principle of a particular religion, okay? So, for example, it is heretical to call yourself a Christian and then deny the bodily resurrection of, the, of Christ, the virgin birth, the divinity of Christ, the church and the Bible, for that matter, um, has always taught these truths clearly and definitively. Now, those are truths that we know that that's what the Bible says, and that's what most churches uh, preach about. When you start to turn away from something that the Bible teaches, that's heresy. That's heresy. So here are the top three heresies in today's culture, uh, but certainly not limited to. I'm only going to hit the top three. Um, oops. So we have, um, hold on one sec, I apologize. We have, uh, Jesus is not God, but just a prophet, right? Right? Um, pastor did, I'm not going to go into that because pastor did the divinity of Christ. And so we all know how important that is. Homosexuality in the church. Um, good people will go to heaven. And if I wanted to add a fourth, uh, another one would be prosperity teaching. Those are really the mainstream. I mean, they go way back. Nothing is new under the sun. But um, th in our culture right now, those are what's uh, most important or what's been going on. Uh, the reason why I'm not going to get into prosperity and the reason why I left it out is because it doesn't affect your salvation. Okay? The others do. And that's the reason why we're going to discuss them because it affects your, your salvation. And that's why... It is bad. It is bad if you start believing some of these heresies uh, because it, it can affect your salvation. Okay, so as far as the homosexuality, we have the rise of homosexual preachers, and, and that's where it gets bad because they're encouraging it to everybody else. They're encouraging it to their congregation. And um, that's, that's really bad. And, and you know what? There are female pastors, too, that are doing this. And let's be honest, that's another heresy, is having a female uh, preacher. A pastor went over that a few weeks ago. What does the Bible say about this? Leviticus 18.22. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. That's how God sees this. Look, I'm not trying to be what people would consider a homophobe, transphobe, or anything like that. I don't even understand that terminology because I'm not afraid of them. That's what phobia means, is you're afraid of something. I'm not afraid of them. None of us, we should love them. But God says it's detestable. That's got to have some sort of weight. It's got to have some sort of merit. That's how God sees it. He calls it an abomination. 
He doesn't say that about murder, things of that, the, the killing of babies. He doesn't say that about that, but he, that's how he labels homosexuality. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and this is where salvation is at stake. Do you or do you not know, and by the way, this is New Testament, so those of you out there, maybe YouTube, they say, well, that was all Old Testament. That's, that's you know, that was the, the way of way back then. This is New Testament. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, and that's where that comes in with these homosexual pastors. Do not be deceived, fornicators, nor idol, or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Effeminate also means, just so you know, if you look it up, that's also acting feminine. So speaking to men who act feminine, that's effeminate. Nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, nor will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what he says. You will not. Such, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. Sanctified means set apart. But you were justified in the name of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So that means that you were, they were homosexual. So you could say, oh, I was born that way. First of all, you weren't. If God says it's detestable, it's an abomination, why on earth would he create you that way? That makes no sense. Why would he create somebody who is homosexual? It's a behavior. And that's what goes by here where he says some of you were. It means they changed their behavior. They are no longer like that. And as, as the result of that, now they're sanctified and they're saved. Listen, I have no problem with a homosexual who, uh, somebody who was a homosexual and is now a pastor, but they repented. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with uh, uh, somebody who was a homosexual in their past, has repented, and no longer lives that lifestyle, and could be a pastor. I don't, I don't have a problem with it whatsoever. The key is that the homosexuality is a lifestyle. That's what makes, that's what makes it different compared to somebody who sins. I sin, you sin, we all sin. But when we repent and we put it to the side, we're trying not to do that activity or behavior anymore. Homosexuality is a lifestyle. That means day in and day out, you're living that life. That's what sets it apart. Okay, so the other one is where people say, I'm a, I'm a good person. And everybody thinks, well, if you ask a lot of people, and they'll say, well, I'm, I'm a good person. And um, let me tell you, I would not want to be judged my best day as a Christian to get me into the gates of heaven. I wouldn't. This is what God says in Isaiah 64, 6. And I'm using the NLT version. And the reason why I'm using it is because the very first line, we are all infected and impure with sin. I like the term infected and impure with sin. And the reason why I like the term infected is what happens when you let an infection go, when you let, when you let it go untreated, what happens to it? It festers, right? And it spreads and it gets worse if you don't treat it. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags, like autumn leaves. We wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. That's how God sees us. He doesn't see us like that when we're saved, because then he's seeing it through the lens of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
We are sanctified. We are set apart. God will remember our sins no more as long as you're born again. So, <laughs> it's funny. Our last vacation we went on, um, I tell you, sometimes I, I, I like to talk to people just on a, a daily basis. Every now and then I'll go up to somebody and I just like to tell them that God loves them. Jesus loves them. And somehow I, I, I tend to ramp that up a little bit more when I'm on vacation. I don't know why. Um, maybe because I got a little bit more time. But we, we were in Florida and I was just about ready to get on the shuttle to get on to the, you know, to take us to uh, the ship. And in my passing, real quickly, I went to this one woman and I told her how Jesus loves her. And uh, he loves you so much. And, uh, and she said, thank you, I know. And uh, I said, he loves you. He, he died for your sins. You know what she told me? She said, oh, honey, I'm not a sinner. And I laughed at her. I couldn't help but to just, I said, yeah. I, I told her, I said, yeah, right. If I had, if that shuttle wasn't waiting for me, boy, would I have to give her an earful. I would have told her that. Listen, you're, you're a filthy rag. You're, you are, every one of us are sinning. You, you, right now, you might not be presently sinning, but give it time. You will. So like Kirk Cameron, what he does, um, him and, um, what's his, this pastor's name? Ray, Raymond. He goes around and they, they encounter people and they have a microphone and, they, and they, uh, they talk to people. Street evangelism. And he'll ask them, so do you think you're a good person? Oh, absolutely. I'm a good person. Really? Well, can we put that to the test? And what he'll do is he'll use the Ten Commandments as a backdrop, as, just as a guide. And he'll start asking them, so have you ever stolen anything before? Anything, even as a stick of gum, have you ever stolen anything? Well, yeah, I, I have. Okay, so what do you call a person who steals? A thief. Okay, so what does that make you? A thief. Okay. Have you ever lied before? Well, yeah, yeah, I lie all the time. Okay, so what do you call a person who lies? A liar. So what does that make you? A liar. Nope, it makes you a lying thief. And then at that point, he still goes on and on and on, and he's, he's saying, well, have you ever looked at somebody with lust? Well, yeah. And um, have you ever used God's name in vain? Oh, yeah, I have. Well, just so you know, that was punishable by death, and God was okay with that in the, New, in the Old Testament. That was something punishable by death. And so now he goes through all these things, right? And then at the very end, he goes, okay, so now I'm not judging you, but by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, um, and uh, adulterer. And he goes, so on, on judgment day, are you going to be guilty or innocent? And all of a sudden, you see their demeanor change at that point. And it's, well, guilty. Heaven or hell? Well, I, I guess hell. It's amazing how when you start to put things into perspective, right? Because most of us have a different, we have a rose-colored perspective about ourselves. You know, for the most part, yeah, we are good people, you know. But by whose definition are we good? When somebody came to Jesus and said, good rabbi, good rabbi, good teacher, he says, why do you call me good? That, that was Jesus, he says, why do you call me good? Look at us. So, a while back I was doing some street evangelizing and we were, we were going around and um, we were talking to some people and I was going down Route 211. I was right in front of St. Mary's Church right here in Montgomery. And I was talking another another uh, brother in Christ with me. And we were talking to this one woman. And uh, we asked her if she was saved. And she was, 
a believer and everything. And she says, you see that church right over there? She goes, I go to that church every Sunday. Okay. Just because I stand in a garage doesn't make me a car. Right? The question is, are you saved? Right? And she said, I'm a good person and all that. So I gave her an analogy. And I said, and she said, you know, I'm a good person. I, I do Typical, typical response is, I'm a good person. And that's the reason why this is a heresy in a sense, because it affects yourself. If you, as long as you think that you're a good person and that you're going to go to heaven, it's not good. You must be a born-again Christian. So I gave her an analogy. I said, okay, so you're a good person. What if you lost everything? I mean Everything, your house, your belongings, every, you have zero, zip. you got nowhere to go. And you see a mansion, and you think in a mansion, clearly this person can take, they, they got so many rooms, clearly they can take me in. Yes, can I help you? Listen, I just lost everything. Can, can I stay with you? I just, I have nowhere to go. I don't even know you. Who, who are you? Right? Isn't that what most people would say? I don't, I don't even know you. And what if all you had to go on was, but I'm a good person. Uh, I go to the pantry. I serve food at the pantry. I hold open doors to people. I, I donate. I donate to my church. Uh, I'm sorry, but I don't, I don't know you. And they'll close the door. Right? Let's change the scenario around. What if you go to a relative's house that you know and loves you? Same scenario. And you knock on the door. Hey, listen, I just lost everything. Oh, you, come on in. You must be hungry. Can I get you something to eat? Listen, I'll, I'll get the bed ready for you. you. Stay as long as you want. Why? Because there's a relationship. We need to have that relationship with Christ. That mansion is the one that Jesus is already preparing for you as a believer. He's preparing a mansion for you. He's preparing a room for you. Why? Because he knows you. John 3.3 says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Right? Ask yourself, are you doing the will of the Lord? That's, a, that's an honest question to be asking ourselves. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. All right? Now, if they didn't have a relationship with Christ, let's say for argument's sake they were not a, uh, born again or anything like that, that just goes to show the power of the, and the authority of Jesus' name, that they were able to do those things in his name. They were able to cast out demons with just his name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Let me tell you, I think any one of us can find ourselves in that position in the sense where, look, we all go to church, right? We all go, we, some of us go to pantry, some of us donate, some of us do a lot of good things, right? Right? And a lot of us could, I could picture myself sometimes saying, Lord, Lord, but Lord, look at all these things I've done for you. I, I, I preach for you, and, I, and I, I'm in Bible study and stuff like that, right? And that, that brings me back to center. Am I doing the will of God? Do I how close has my relationship been with God lately? Right? 
We need to have that fellowship with God. We need to spend the time in God's word. That, by, by the way, that to me is the scariest section of the Bible right there as, as a Christian. By far. That is the scariest verse. It, I, again, I, at times that when I, I find myself going away from God, I revert to that. And I'm like, oh man. Imagine having that sinking feeling, having God tell you that. How do we protect ourselves from heresy, right? That's, that's an honest question. Well, for starters, you should be studying, not just reading, you should be studying your Bible. We have three Bible studies in our church. Not all of us go. Let's be honest. Three of them. One of them is online. So if you get home late, there's that. Um, we have one in the middle of the week on Wednesdays. And then we have pastors in the beginning of Sunday before church. Some of us, I know, have a hard time just getting to church on time. But if you get here even earlier, you could spend time in the Word with pastor. It's a great way to set you up for worshiping later on. We are, and this is most important, we are to test the spirits, right? So, 1 John 4, 1 through 3, dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. That's a lot of these, these pastors. You must test them to see if their spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Okay, so how, what do we do? He, Paul tells us. This is how we know if they have the spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the spirit of God. Okay, so that's, that's good. But if somebody claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God, right? Right away, Jehovah's people, they go around and that person is not from God. They do not believe Jesus is God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But here is the good news. 1 John 4, 4 to 6. But you belong to God. My dear children, you have already won a victory over those people. That's cool. I love that verse. You have already won a victory just by being born again. Right? The freedom that you have in Jesus Christ of all your past sins have been released. God will remember them no more. That's amazing freedom. You no longer have to worry about that. You don't have to focus on the person that you've been, the person that you were. Now you, would, you direct your attentions to being the person you could be with Christ as the backdrop. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. There's a lot of spirits in the world they're demons. You are greater than those because you have God. You take Jesus with you everywhere you go. How about that? And he is greater than any of those spirits that are in this world. Those, those people belong to this world. Right? They're worldly people. So speak, so they speak from the world's viewpoint. Right? When you hear the news and stuff like that, they're giving you worldly perspectives. They're not giving you godly perspectives. And the world listens to them. But we belong to God. And those who know God listen to us, right? We are the salt and the light of the world. We had a, uh, a, a few weeks ago at Bill's um, Bible study, we talked about being salt and light. 
And it was, it was really good once you start getting into it. Really, really good. And uh, we are the sight, the, the salt and the light of the world. I'm not going to go into that. But later on today, just reflect on what it means. And you could even look it up. Just reflect on what it means to be the light of the world and the salt of the world. That's what's expected of you. That's doing God's will. If they do not belong to God, they do not, uh, they do not listen to us. That is how we know somebody's spirit has truth, has the, has the, somebody has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. That is how we know. So there you have it. That's from the Apostle Paul. That's what he's saying. That's how you know. What you need to do is you always need to and this is the reason why we need to study our Bibles. When you know what the Bible says, as soon as somebody is a false prophet or speaking something differently than what the Bible is saying, you're gonna be, it's going to be a red flag to you. You're going to be like, wait a minute. Huh. That's not what the Bible says. Now, if you know your Bible, you can do that on the fly. And that's why it's important. is because you could do it on the fly. You don't have to look it up even if you know the context of it and not necessarily know the Bible verses from verbatim, from, from memory. But at least if you know the context of it, like, wait a minute, something's not right, then you could always look it up. But whatever is somebody is saying, it should be what the Bible is saying as well. That's how you know if it's from the Spirit of God or not. The minute they, they, they go off track, the minute they say something, and, and keep in mind, the way Satan works is it's something that's just a little bit different than the absolute truth. It's always going to be a little bit different. If it's a complete outright lie, you're going to be like, that's a lie. And you know it. But if it sounds like the truth, you're going to be more susceptible to listen to it and believe it. Remember, 99% of the truth is a lie. It's a complete lie. Only the truth is the truth. And you know, some people will say, well, I have my truth and you have your truth. No, no. The truth is the truth. Your truth can be an opinion. And my truth can be opinion unless it's verified by what the Bible says. The truth is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much. We thank you for your word. Jesus, you are the word, and we thank you for your word. Lord, we just ask that you give us wisdom. You give us the wisdom that we need to protect ourselves from heresies, from false truths, from false prophets. Lord, we ask that when we do read our Bible and when we do come to church and we do worship you, that we retain everything that we hear, Lord. Let us just be a sponge so that it can protect us later on, Lord, so that we know what is right and what's wrong and what is not your truth, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Louie. In response to the word that's just been preached, let's search our hearts. And if you're caught by any of those heresies or that Louie has mentioned, maybe some others, know that God loves you and God wants you to turn toward him and he's already pursuing you in love and mercy and grace and that he wants to make thing, help you to make things right. Let's examine our hearts before the Lord after which we will pray the prayer found in your bulletins. Let us pray the prayer of confession found in your bulletins. Merciful God, 
We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the absolution from God's word. The Apostle John said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. At this time, I invite the brothers who are going to serve communion. If you have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, though you're part of any other church, you're welcome here. So, would the brothers come? <clears throat> On the night before our Lord Jesus was handed over to death, he had a Passover meal with his disciples. And at a certain point in the meal, he took bread, it was a matzah actually, and he prayed this prayer. Baruch atayu donayu lecheno melecha olam hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz, which means, blessed art thou, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Then the Lord Jesus took that bread that he just gave thanks over, and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, at a certain point in the Passover meal, the Lord took the cup and he prayed the other blessing. Baruch atay Adonai lecheno melecha olam bori puri hagafen, which means, blessed art thou, Lord Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and he said about that cup, he said, this cup is different than any other cup you're going to drink tonight. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, the covenant in which all sin would be forgiven, the covenant in which the Holy Spirit would descend upon those who believe and receive him. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, take and drink it in memory of me. At this time, uh, the brothers will pass out the elements, and would you hold on to yours? We will partake together.
Beloved brethren, let us all partake together of the broken body of Jesus Christ. Beloved in the Lord, let us partake together of the blood of Christ. <laughs> let us pray. Father, we thank you that you have fed us with your word and given us direction we could not have had had you not come in the flesh and spoken to the apostles and the prophets. We thank you, Father, for those mysteries that have been explained to us, Father, that we receive, though we may not be able to explain every jot and tittle about what they're about and how that they affect us. We thank you, Father, for the word that has come to us verbally and that word that has come to us in the body and blood of Christ. And we pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would continue to affect us, that he would continue to explain to us the word of God as we reflect upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Could I invite you to stand with me and let's sing together number 526, uh, The Solid Rock. Jesus is that solid rock. Number five. 26. All other rocks are slippery and sinking sand. Let's sing together. for God's blessing. 
Now may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, and may the Holy Spirit inspire you to read. May the Holy Spirit inspire you to study. May the Holy Spirit inspire you to grab a hold of the great faiths, the, the great truths that are enshrined in the word of God. May the Holy Spirit cause you to trust the apostles who Christ has sent in his name and to embrace what they say as normative for the church. And may the Holy Spirit give you wisdom. May he send red flags in your heart when you hear that which is not in accord with those who have become the foundations of the church, Jesus and his holy apostles. Now may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.